Welcome everyone to our event, Stories from the Big House. Um, in a moment, we're going to be hearing all about the Big House, um, including stories from Mrs. Bullis the Cook, Edward James the Hall Boy, Alice O'Malley the Nanny, and Lady Jemima as the Suffragette. Uh, just before we start, um, you may need the following items um, during this activity. Um, so first of all, if you've printed out the pages uh, for the Passport to the Past, you will be needing the special pages focused on stories from the pig house. Um, if you haven't had a chance to print these out, um, please don't worry. Um, a couple of pieces of paper will do instead. Um, you will also need a pen and a pen or, or a pencil, sorry. Um, now, if it is your parents' name on the screen, it would be great if you could change it to your name instead. Um, first name only, please. Um, and that way, um, you know, if you want to ask questions or we're chatting to you, um, we get the name right. Um, if you would like to ask questions, um, you can do this uh, at any time by either raising your hand um, or you can type the question into chat. For the rest of the time, we just ask you to put yourself on mute, then you don't have to worry about pets barking or, or little brothers and sisters. Um, we are going to be showing some pre-recorded videos um, during today's session. Um, so um, obviously it would be more difficult to um, ask questions during those. So just hold on to your questions if you have them um, and we'll give you an opportunity um, to chat to us after they finish. Uh, we are going to be filming this session. Um, so if you're not happy about being seen, um, please switch off your camera and put your mi uh, switch your microphone to mute. Um, and during the presentation, um, we're going to be sending you each a different word on chat. So if you could look out for that, that would be brilliant. Um, this is going to be used later on in the session when we're going to be doing our own storytelling. Um, so just hold on to that word for the moment. and We'll explain what it all means a little bit later on. Uh, we're now going to give you just a minute or so um, to grab a bit of paper and a pen if you haven't already done so and then we'll be starting our session. Um, it's really great to see so many faces there um, and we're really looking forward to today's event. Okay, we'll be back in about a minute or so. Thank you. So we're going to start off with our um, traditional big hello to everybody. So after three, a big hello and a wave. One, two, three. Hello. 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 And welcome, everybody. So it's great we can see um, some people we've seen before and some new people as well. So that's brilliant. We're delighted to have you all. Um, so what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be finding out about what it was like to live in a big house. So you may think that you live in a big house, if you're very lucky. Um, but we're talking about a specific type of big house um, where a family lived there and also lots of people who worked for the family, lots of servants lived there as well. Um, and we're going to be meeting some of those servants and some of the people who lived in the big house. And at the end of the session, we're going to be writing and creating our own stories. So what is a big house? We've got a picture of a big house here with a family standing in front. And it's um, a mansion or a large house, often in the countryside. Lots of these big houses had over 100 rooms. They had a lot of land, including gardens, very often beautifully looked after gardens and parks and also farmland. And they were owned by very wealthy people, aristocrats and the people who ruled the country in the past. You needed to have a lot of money to run a big house like that. So generations of the same family owned and lived in the same house, often for centuries. 
And so the houses often had grandparents and parents and children and extended family members all living under the same roof together. But because the houses were very large and had so many rooms, there was plenty of space for everybody. Now, in the 1800s, many of the big houses brought in modern gadgets, which they hadn't happened to, had up until that point, like flushing loos and gas lighting, which was later upgraded to electric lighting, boilers and running water. Uh, and quite often the owners had lavish parties. So Sir so Christopher Codrington, and that's a, like a, a famous Gloucestershire aristocratic family, on his 21st birthday um, in March 1826, the, the party lasted for five days. And in today's money, it would have cost about £13,000. So that is some party. So the wealthy owners very often didn't spend very much time with their own children. So um, young members of the family were often brought up by nannies or governesses. And quite often, the only time they would see their parents would be for an hour a day. Uh, so the, the governess or the nanny would get them dressed up for tea time and they would go and have tea with their own parents. Charlie, you are making me laugh. Uh, <laughs> and, and that might be the only time that they spent with their parents. The rest of the time, they would be looked after by a servant, by a nanny. Um, so uh, we, we're going to be meeting one of these nannies and she's called Alice O'Malley. We're going to be meeting her a little bit in a little while. Um, so the houses were looked after and run by servants and they lived in the house as well. Their bedrooms were up in the attic, so up under the roof. Um, and it was very hot there in the summer and freezing cold in the winter. Uh, the servants didn't get very much money, they didn't have any employment rights, and they worked long hours, often from six o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. They had very little time off and were very rarely allowed holidays. So in fact, um, in the Victorian times, but many servants were only allowed one day off a year. And that might be the only time that they had where they could see their own families. The rest of the time they spent looking after the house and the family in the big house. Um, so some servants started work in the big house when they were only eight or 10 years old. So young children and the youngest workers did the worst jobs, such as emptying the chamber pots. Anybody know what a chamber pot is? Anybody ever heard of a chamber pot? George, what's a chamber pot? Take yourself off mute so we can hear you. That's it. Like a toilet. Exactly. So it's a to it's not a flushing toilet. So it was literally a, a china pot which people used to keep under their beds, and the the sort of youngest servant in the house, it would be their job to empty those pots and and um, clean them out in the mornings. Not a job that I would particularly like to do. So we've got a picture now of um, some of, uh, just a few people who were employed at Doddington Park, which is one of the big um, houses in Gloucestershire. And this is in the year 1890. So the, the staff that we can see pictured are the um, male staff who worked outside. So these aren't the people who worked inside the house. They're people who looked after the gardens and the park and the farmland. And as you can see, there's quite a list there. I'll give you a couple of minutes to have a look at that. Um, so lots of the jobs were to do with looking after horses because horses were obviously very, very important in the past because they were a form of transport and they would probably have pulled the farm machinery as well. Um, so there's a groom there who was looking after the horses and also cow, a cowman and a cowboy who would look after um, the cattle which would be kept on the, the farm which was part of the big house. So as we said already, some servants started work very young. So how old do you think these children are? So we've got two little children in the front row there. Have a, have a look at those two boys. How would, have a guess, how old do you think they might be? Anybody? Seb, what do you reckon? Oh, Seb, you're on mute. 18 or 19. <laughs> Ah, oh, you think they're so you think they're a little bit older than I think they are. To me, they yeah. look a little bit younger than that, Seb. Uh, and I think they're maybe sort of 11 or 12 years old. Oh, sorry, Austin. Are you Austin or Max with your hand up? I'm Austin. No, I'm Max. I think okay. about eight, eight to nine. 
Okay, so you think a little bit younger. Anyway, they're quite mm -hmm. young, aren't they? Um, and the, 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 the boy on the left, um, his surname is White, and he's a stable boy, so he works looking after the horses. And the other boy is called, his surname is Jenkins, and he's a gardener. Now, in the, in the big picture, the man on the far left is a blacksmith, and he's also called Jenkins. So he is probably the dad of young Jenkins. And the mum of young Jenkins probably works in the big house as well, because it was very common for whole families to work in the, in the big house. So she might have worked in the house as a maid or perhaps in the kitchens. So we've got some pictures here, and these are documents which we have in the archives so these are things which we have kept um, and we look after in our arch archives so um, you can see on the left is the kitchen bills so um, that's all handwritten in this beautiful neat handwriting and it's um, what they was paid for meat and milk and cream and fish and charcoal which were they would have used for cooking and there's the housekeeper's accounts which keeps a list of all the wages that were paid and in this whole book which I can show you here it's all written in this beautiful neat writing I hope you can see that um, and there is not a mistake or a crossing out in the whole thing um, which is quite extraordinary So here we have some menus from a two-day banquet at Batsford Park, which is another big um, stately home in Gloucestershire. Uh, so this was a banquet which went on for two days. Um, some strange dishes. One of the things that we noticed when we were looking at it just now is that there's what looks like a pudding course. So on, on the first day, it was iced strawberry cream. And then after that, they had um, anchovy tartlets, and anchovies are <laughs> um, um, very salty, strong tasting fish. So it's like quite unusual food. Here are some more of the recipes, and you're going to be meeting a cook from the big house. She's called Maisie Bullis. We're going to meet her in a few minutes. Um, and these are some of her recipes for things like lemon pickle and a sauce for boiled carp. And again, these are documents that we keep here in the archives um, that people can come and look at. And that's how we find out a lot about what people used to eat in the park and what uh, in the past and what people what used to happen in, in, in the big houses. So we're coming up to um, meeting some of those characters we've been talking about. And the first person that we're going to meet is um, called Mrs. Maisie Bullis. And she is the cook. And the year is about 1850. So over to you, Maisie. Hello, children. My name is Mrs. Bullis. And I want you to guess what I do. These are the tools of my trade. So what do you think, children, I do for a living? Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm the cook at the big house, and these are all the things I use in the kitchen. You can call me Maisie, but my name is Mrs. Bullis, and everybody at the big house calls me Mrs. Bullis. I'm visiting you from 1850. That's all, oh, my lord. That's over 150 years ago, 170 years ago. And I was born in the year of our Lord in 1800. And I've written down a few notes because I wanted to tell you everything about what I do. So I'm just going to pick them up. So I came from the West Country to this big house. And when I was a child, there was father and mother and 11 of us children. We were all born at home. Father was a blacksmith. Now, do you know what a blacksmith is? We live next door to the smithy where the blacksmith worked. Mother was a washerwoman and she took in sewing. She made clothes for all of us children and we lived in a two bedroom cottage. All things considered, children, I've done very, very well for myself, rising in, 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 to, the, to the position of cook in the big house. Now you'll have to excuse me because I'm an old lady for 50 and I'm just going to have a sip of water. Now I want to tell you about something in particular. Christmas was my favourite time of the year when I was a kiddie. Was Christmas your favourite time of the year? 
I think it probably is your favourite time of the year. Well, we always had snow in my day. And remember, this is the early 1800s. I'm going way back now, 200 years. We always had a goose that mother would roast. And all of us children had a Christmas stocking and we'd have an orange, a new penny, a handmade toy and one other little item. We always had chestnuts, which father would roast in the ash pan under the fire. And I'm very proud of the fact I went to school till I was 10 years old and I'm able to read and write. And a lot of people of my age, children, they cannot read and write, but I'm very proud. As you can see, I'm reading now all the notes that I wrote down to tell you about my life. We'd always help with the harvest as children every summer and we didn't have the things you have today. So there were no mobile phones and no computers and no TV. We kept a few chickens for the eggs. We brought the, the cream and the milk and the butter from the farm. And we sometimes, father sometimes bought a brace of pigeon or a rabbit from the local poacher whose name was Sam. Do you know what a poacher is? You must ask, ask your parents and they'll tell you. <clears throat> we had a well in the back garden where we drew all our water in buckets that we would lower down into the well. And we had a bath once a month in an old tin bath called a galvanized bath in front of the fire. Those were the days. Those were the days we thought we were rich. Mind you, mind you children, most of us kiddies had knits or head lice. Terrible, terrible things. Mother would comb them out with a steel comb. We went to church every Sunday and I attended Sunday school from age six to age eight. Very, very happy days. Now I started work in domestic service at the age of 11. I would wake up, I would have to start work five o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock in the evening, every single day as a scullery maid. So I had to wash up, I had to clean the kitchen, I had to clean the pantry, I had to lay the coals, I had to wash the bottles. Good Lord, it makes me dizzy. It makes me dizzy to think about it. Anyway, I had to help the cook. And then as the years went by, I worked my way up. I minded my P's and my Q's and I ended up as the cook in the big house. And I'm very, very proud of the work I do as a cook. Now, shall I tell you a little bit? Shall I tell you some secrets about the Lord and Lady of the big house? One of his Lordship's favorites that I have to cook for him for breakfast, mind you, is kedgeri, kedgeri. Now kedgeri is yellow haddock, so that smoked haddock, with a few sultanas thrown in, um, softly cooked in milk with some curry paste and some rice. Now he eats this for breakfast and the reason he eats it for breakfast is he used to be a colonel in the Indian army and that's what they eat in India. Kedgeri. They eat it for breakfast, they eat it for dinner, they eat it for supper. And that's what he likes. Now, I think it's a real queer kettle of fish. I wouldn't want to eat that. Anyway, another favourite <clears throat> is something called devil kidneys. You will never have heard of devil kidneys. I bet my life and soul on it. But you probably don't know what devil kidneys are all about. Now, devil kidneys it's where you cook the kidneys till they're very, very taste, very soft. You mix them, you, you, you cook them with onions, you mix them with rice, you serve them on toast or just with some rice on the side. Um, it's nothing to do with devils, children. Devil kidneys is nothing to do with devils. Other favorites of his lordships include bloaters, which is a type of really big fish, a bit like me. <laughs> Venison a rack of lamb, pheasant with red cabbage, and we poach a whole salmon when we've got one. Oh, and I cook myself, I cook for the house my own recipe, uh, gammon, which is a big ham that I cook um, every Christmas. Me, I like a nice plate of bread and cheese with a crispy apple and some of my homemade piccalilli and a glass of cider because I'm a West Country woman. I make all my own pastry, I make all my own bread and cakes, I make scones for afternoon tea, and I can gut a fish or a rabbit 
or a pheasant quicker than you can say Jack Robinson. So there. And I pride myself on my cooking skills. And I want to share something with you today, children. Now, this is a piece of advice from Maisie Bullis. Never, ever, ever trust a skinny cook. Bye, children. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> bye, Mrs. Bullis. So Mrs. Bullis there talking about some of the meals that she likes preparing. Devil kidneys to me sounds absolutely disgusting. Um, has anybody, would anyone fancy eating that? Of course, back in those days, um, it was very, very, very unusual for people to be vegetarians. Most people, um, even poorer people, would have considered meat to be a very important part of their meal. And we're about to meet another character. And um, this is, um, he's called Edward James, and his job is called the Hall Boy. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Edward James now, and he's going to tell you his story. Hello there. Oh, my name's Edward, and I'm the hall boy here at the big house. Now, you might think it a bit funny because, well, between you and me, I'm an old man, aren't I? But I've worked at the house now for, ooh, it must be 45 years I've worked there. I quite like it. It's quite good fun, but you have to be careful. You have to be careful of Mr. Jackson. He's the butler, and I tell you what, that cook, Mrs. Bullis. Oh, blimey, she can be a tartar, I can tell you, and I wouldn't like to be one of her kitchen mates. But anyway, let's, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Well, so my name's Edward, and I was born here in the village on the estate up the road there. Now, oh, my dad was born in the village, my mum was born in the village down the road, and they've never left it, but I have. I've been to Bristol. It's a long way away. Went by stagecoach and it took us all day. Eight hours, and it, oh, it was bumpy, but very, very bumpy. Anyway. What do I do here? I suppose you want to know what I do as a hall boy. Well, I should actually do a bit of everything. So mostly my most important job is cleaning the shoes. I've got to clean the shoes for the butler and all the footmen. Okay, all the male servants out. So I clean their shoes every night. That's I've done it for a long time now. But I do other things as well. So I will sharpen the tools for the gardener. So there's a nice axe and I love a billock here. So he likes me cleaning, likes me sharpening them. I have a good time with the gardener. We often go and chat together. But what else do I do in the house? Well, I, it's, again, it's everything. I have to make sure that all the wood buckets are full, all the coal buckets are full, and I have to give them to the chambermaids so they go up stairs and I give it to the parlour mates. So I do a lot of different things. I also run errands for people. So only the other day the master came up to me and said, Edward, I want you to nip down to the village to the blacksmith. Can you go and get me, give me word for getting a new shoe from yours? So I had to go and do all that. So I do lots of things like that all over the place. Now, what's it like here? Well, it's, it's nice. We have, we have good food, quite good work. It's not dangerous like on the farm. And it's funny, I thought I'd be a farmer, thought I was going to be a farmer, working here on the farm on the estate like my dad before me. But one day he comes up to me, says, Edward, I've got me a job at the big house. You're going to be a hall boy. You're going to get eight pound a year and you're going to get two days off a year. Well, blimey, eight pound? I was fabulous. I've never heard of so much money before. That's about, I think it's about 650 pounds a year in your money. Gosh, it was brilliant. But say, that was a long time ago, and now I get paid, I get paid 18 pounds a year. That's over a thousand pounds in your money. So it's wonderful. I get all my food and board paid in and everything. It's great. I used to sleep in the hall on a fold down bed, but I'm lucky now because we've got a younger hall boy because I'm, I'm getting a bit old and a bit big and I can't do that much anymore, really. The master likes me, so he keeps me on. So with the new hall boy, he sleeps there in the hall now, and I've got a room all to myself. I can tell you it's really, really good. I really like it. Now, the butler told me you were coming today, and he said, Edward, why don't you make a list of what you did normally? What you do, what you do yesterday? I said, that's a very good idea. So I got him to write it down. I can do a bit of writing in numbers, but it's not my best. So I got it all written down here, what I did yesterday. So. And I've got to get some glasses to read this because they're not very good ones. They're old ones, but they're better than nothing. So, okay, what did I do? Well, 6 a.m. I got up and I got washed and dressed. I made my bed and I woke up the new hall boy to start his work. 6.30, I started cleaning all of the boots. 
okay? So the upper servants and the butler and some of the family members as well. The butler, the cook and the housekeeper, they all get up around 7, 7.30, so their boots need to be cleaned and ready for them to wear, okay? The other family members, them upstairs, they don't get up till, well, gone 8 o'clock usually, something like that. So, 7.30. I went round and I emptied the chamber pots. You know what a chamber pot is, isn't you? It's where you have a wee in the night and a little little bucket thing. Okay, I emptied all them for everybody. And I have to wash them out as well. It's not a very good, nice job, but I'm going to make the new hall boy do it soon. It's going to be much easier for him. Anyway, 7.45, I helped lay the table for breakfast in the servants' hall. We don't eat upstairs, of course. We eat downstairs, where most of us live. And at 8.15 it was breakfast, and it's really nice breakfast, but bread and cheese, and we had a lovely bit of bacon today, which was wonderful. Anyway, 9.15, we have to go to prayers in the big hall. The master takes us all for a prayer service, so everybody has to go. It doesn't last long though, just say a few prayers, Lord's Prayer mainly, that's mostly the one I can remember. So we did that. Anyway, 9.30, that's when I started my daily duties, and as I say, I helped tidy up in the scullery, I went and chopped some wood, okay, and I went and loaded all the coal into the scuttles. We usually have to take hot water upstairs all the time, that can be a really hard job, but the master is thinking of getting piped water in the house, hot and cold. That'll be fantastic, won't it? Won't have to do any work then. Well, mostly. I'll have to keep shoveling coal into the boiler, but, you know, that's not so bad. Anyway, 10.30, I help lay the servants' table for tea. We have a cup of tea, and that's, that's about 11 o'clock we do that. Now, usually, the butler has a meeting with the master of the house just before then, and then I get loads of jobs afterwards. But, as it happened, there was nothing to do yesterday, so it was really good. Had a nice, easy day. 12 o'clock, dinner. My special job is I lay the table and then I go and ring the dinner bell for people. And then they come down and they'll assemble for dinner. I say people, it's all the servants, really. Anyway, after lunch, cleared away the dishes. Then I had to go and go down and start chopping some wood. We had a tree fell down in the park the other day. So I went and saw the head gardener just to ask him, can he bring some wood up? Because we're getting a bit, bit, a bit thinner wood up here. So we went and got his men down and that's what we did. Right. After that time to lay the table for tea that's three o'clock that was lovely and then four o'clock we had tea in the servants hall that was wonderful we had a nice bit of cake i know i say about that mrs bullis the cook she's a bit of a tartar you know but she does make a lovely cake so it's really nice if you get to see her ask her about a cake i would 5 p.m i went upstairs and i refilled all the oil lamps in the house that's a long job and it takes a long time. I have to be very careful I don't spill it. You know, it can be a bit messy. I did spill one the other day and I got to get the maid in to clear it up, but it wasn't too bad. Anyway, six o'clock, went to the cook and I helped to sort start laying the tea table for dinner. Okay, that's sort of our, that's the big, big dinner upstairs. It's an hard hour dinner. We eat a bit later. Um, and then it was really good. They didn't have any guests in the big house last night, so the master gave us a lot of time off. So we had lunch, or dinner if you call it, we had that early. We had it about quarter past eight. It was wonderful. We had a great big long table full of food, and they actually we had some roast beef. I know it's not a Sunday, but it was roast beef left over from the Sunday. It was gorgeous. Mrs. Bullish, she did a fine job there. And then after that, we helped clear up, did some washing, okay, and then it was almost time for bed. I had a little bit of relaxation. And we actually played a game of dominoes downstairs, which we do that sometimes with the footman. That could be quite fun. Hard work, but it's fun. Anyway, the last, the last job of the day, I had to go up, collect all the boots, all these shoes, bring them back down, and then I could, so I could clean them first thing in the morning. By the time I'd done that, it was about half past 11. So then I went to bed. It was wonderful. So that was a typical day that I did. It was really fun. Anyway, let's see what time is now. It's, uh... oh gosh, yeah, it's getting a bit late. So um, I'd better go because I've got to get these boots back and I've also got to get this bullock sharpened. So I'll see you next time. You have to take care. Bye-bye.
So we've met Edward James, the hall boy, an old man still working very, very long hours for the family at the big house. But he would have been glad to have had that job because for people who didn't have a job and didn't have any income coming in, things were very, very tough in those times. So we've got two more people to meet from the big house. One more member of staff, and that's Alice O'Malley. Um, the nanny. The last person we're going to meet is one of the family. We're going to meet Lady Jemima. But Alice O'Malley, the nanny, is coming up next. And you might see a family resemblance because Alice is actually my great, great, great aunt. Oh, now I have to look at you lot as well, have I? As well as my usual two charges. My name is Alice O'Malley. That's Miss Alice to you. I'm the nanny and it's my job to try and bring the children of the house up to be a proper young gentleman and a young lady. May the good Lord take pity on me. John is 12 now and Jemima is 11. Their little sister Clemmy died of the whooping cough when she was but three years old. God rest her soul. Sir James and Lady Charlotte have never recovered from losing their little angel. All the money in the world could not save that precious child. Well, you may think that John and Jemima are too old to need a nanny, and you'd be right. But I've worked for the family for nigh on 40 years, and I haven't seen my own family or had time to get married and have children of my own. So they let me stay on and say that I will be able to end my days here. I hope I can help the children grow up to be a proper lord and lady. As the children from the big house, they will have a duty when they're grown to take care of the staff and tenants who belong to the household. It's not as if I'm not used to a lot of children. You know, I was the eldest of 12 myself and looked after my little brothers and sisters while my parents were working on the farm. Do you know what this is? Well, of course you do. It's a potato. But there's a link between this potato and how I came to be here in this big English house looking after the children when by rights I should still be on the family farm in my own beautiful country of Ireland. You might not believe it now, but when I arrived here in 1848, I was literally starved. I had no flesh on my bones at all. I was just like one of them skeletons. I don't think I would have survived if Mrs. Bullis, the cook, hadn't taken pity on me and fed me on scraps from her kitchen. Don't be fooled, by the way. She's a kind soul, really. Like many farms in Cork in Ireland, where I lived until I was 17 years old, we grew potatoes and nothing else. And that's what we ate. We were too poor to buy meat or even bread, but potatoes fill your belly and we didn't often go to bed hungry. We had nothing else. Oh, but then came the terrible time when our crops failed and rotted in the ground. We had nothing else to eat or to sell. All the farms and families around us were in the same situation. I found out afterwards that it came to be called the Great Hunger and it lasted for many years, but I did not stay in Ireland to see this. As the oldest girl in the family, I came to England and was lucky enough to get a job in the laundry at the big house. I sent all the money I earned, 13 pounds a year, home to my family in Cork. My sister Kathleen wrote to me to say that all my family had survived, thank the good Lord. But my brothers and sisters had scattered to the four winds to find work and food. Declan is in Australia now, would you believe? And Hannah is in America. Kathleen ended up working in a, as a maid in a big house in Bristol, only 50 miles from here. It's my dream that one day we may see each other again by God's good grace. Well, the family at the big house noticed I was good with the little ones. So after a while, that became my work. I looked after Sir James when he was a boy, and now I take care of his children, John and Jemima. Jemima is a rowdy maid who refuses to act like a little lady, has all sorts of fancy ideas. She gets those from her mother. John is a kind boy, but a delicate one, and I do worry for him. His father insists that he must ride out with the hunt, but he prefers to stay with me while I sit and mend the bedroom linen. If Jemima could go out on the hunt, I'm sure she would be leading the charge. So Giles has decided that John should have a career in politics, which he says is the fitting for the son of a wealthy landowner but John prefers to stay quietly at home. Yesterday, he showed me his designs for some elegant new furnishings for the drawing room, but I had to swear not to say a word to his father. That kind of work is not fitting for a young master, he'd say. And so Giles often threatens John with a spell in the army. That'll toughen you up, he says. His sister has her own ideas about everything in God's green earth, including how a young lady should be dressed. 
why can't girls wear breeches? She asks me. The child has no sense of decency at all. A maid dressed like a boy, indeed. Not while I still draw breath, I says to her. Excuse me, I must go. Jemima, Jemima, what in the name of all that is holy are you doing out there, child? You've no business to be talking to the butcher's boy. Go round to the tradesman's door, my lad. Cook will see you there and take this week's order. That young lady will be the death of me. So that was Alice, my great, great, great auntie. Finally, we're going to meet Lady Jemima. We're going to find out who that naughty old Jemima grew up to be. Um, and then we're going to create our own story after that. So over to you, Lady Jemima. Hello, children. I am Lady Jemima and I live in the big house with my father, my mother, my brother, John, and a housekeeper, maids, cook, nanny and gardeners. The year is 1913. I was born in 1880. My father was a colonel in the army and my mother runs the house. I was well educated in reading, writing, Latin, French, arithmetic, music, art, modern history and the classics. I did not go to university, but I could have. It is only recently that women have been allowed to attend university. All of the girls that I grew up with now live in their own houses with their own husbands and their own children. But I'm not married, even though I'm 33 years old. Very few women marry this old and people call me a spinster, but I don't mind. I find that I'm far too busy to look after a husband, a house and children. Years ago, mother and I went to a meeting in the house uh, in the town of Bath, where the speaker said that women were equal to men and that they should be allowed to vote. The women were called suffragettes. Maybe in the future, women will be able to vote for who should run the country. But in 1913, today's date, only men are allowed to do so. Now, children, why do you think voting is so important? Our country is run by leaders called politicians. They meet and decide on new laws and they solve problems. But the politicians are chosen by the people. The people get to vote in something called an election, and that decides who the leaders are. Politicians then decide things like whether we should go to war, how to look after the environment, whether we should have a free national health service for all, what we are taught in schools, and everything else which may affect our lives. Before I was born, only very rich men who own lots of land were allowed to vote. But recently, it was decided that all men over 21 should be able to vote, but not us women. This means that women have no say whatsoever in how the country is run. This is something I do not agree with at all. And so mother and I joined the local suffragette group and for many years have been campaigning for a new law allowing women to vote for how the country is run. I help run a suffragette shop in Bath which gives out leaflets and sells badges and other to items to keep the campaign going. My family supports everything that I do and my father even gives me an allowance, some money each week, so that I can carry on helping the Votes for Women campaign. I know lots of other girls who are suffragettes, but many of their families won't even talk to them. They think that only men should have a say in how the country is run and that women should only care about girlish things like sewing, looking after children and running a home. My family even allows other suffragette women to stay at our house when they're giving talks near us. Father picks them up at the train station in his new car and everyone stares. They think it is very exciting because very few people can afford their own car and many people still use horse pulled carriages to travel. The car is very loud and it goes very fast. It does not have a roof, so sometimes we get rained on. Lots of different women are suffragettes. I even met an Indian princess. My friend Annie, another suffragette, often comes to visit. Annie is from a poor family. Sometimes I mend her gloves for her and I'm teaching her to speak French. I like to stay in touch with my friends and write several letters every evening to them. I go to suffragette meetings every week where women speak about how important it is that women can vote. Annie often speaks and she speaks very well. However, I am afraid to speak in case people laugh or I forget what to say. So instead I sell the tickets. Sometimes the crowd cheers for the suffragettes and at other times they shout at the speakers and say terrible things. 
Last week, we arrived outside a meeting and children threw things at us and Clara hurt her head. We have decided to pay policemen to come to our meetings to protect us in the future. After the meetings, we often go out to dinner or lunch. And only yesterday, I went to the assembly rooms where I had fish with potatoes. Afterwards, a man in the street called me a suffragette and I felt proud. The leader of the campaign to get women the vote, Mrs Pankhurst, often organises marches to London. Sometimes they march to the Houses of Parliament where the politicians meet to decide how the country is run. She's asked me to join them. They've started breaking windows and setting post boxes on fire. They say that the politicians will not listen to them and so they have to get their attention by causing disruption and breaking things. Mrs Pankhurst and many others have been arrested lots of times for breaking the law. Father said I was not allowed to break the law and so I wrote to Mrs Pankhurst saying that I would not join her for her marches. Two of my friends, Jesse and Vera, even attacked the Prime Minister and were sent to jail. Mother was very angry and said she would no longer go to the meetings if the suffragettes were going to do such things. Mother and father have even said that Vera and Jesse were no longer allowed to stay at our house. The newspapers are saying we might go to war with Germany and Austria-Hungary. I hope they are wrong. I do not want my brother John to have to go to fight. And what will happen to the suffragettes if war breaks out? Will people forget about the importance of women voting? I hope that in my lifetime, I will see women get the vote and that all my hard work will be worthwhile. Perhaps one day I will even find time for a husband. Okay, so thank you, Lady Jemima. Um, so we've heard from the four characters um, from The Big House now, and it's almost time to move on to our story. Has everybody received a word from us through the chat? Can you put your hand up or let us know that you've got your word and that you know what the word means? Ruth, have you got a word? Have we sent you a word? Okay, how about you, George? Can you give us a thumbs? You got a word, George? I don't think George will come. Perhaps can't hear. Anyway, um, ha before we... Oh, Rosa, did you want to say something? Uh, before we go on to our, our story, has anybody got any questions about or for any of the characters that we met from the big house? Okay, we will crack on then. So we've got a storytelling activity that we've planned today and what we want to do is um, we've sent each of you a word and the, it's a sort of a game so you write a very very short story we're only going to give you a couple of minutes to do this two or three minutes to write a story and in that story you have to try and hide the word that we've given you because after you've told your story we're all going to have to try and guess what the word we sent you was so try and get your word in past everybody without us knowing what the word was so if it's a word you wouldn't usually use you might want to put in a couple of other words that you wouldn't usually use just to confuse us a little bit or you might have ideas of your own about how you can get that word in without us easily guessing what it is we're going to have three guesses does anybody not understood what the story game is anybody like me to explain again ruth would you like me to explain again okay so we've sent you a word and you are going to write a little story and the story is going to feature somebody from the big house it's going to be set in the big house and it's going to have somebody from the big house is is in the story and you're going to use that word in your story so um, and we afterwards everyone who's listening to the story is going to guess and try and guess which the word is that we sent you so you have to try and make it difficult for us to guess so it's we're only going to have a couple of minutes to do this have, have i explained it properly now have you got that I don't think I've explained it that well. Okay, all right, shall we go then? So we're gonna say, um, has everybody got something to write with and something to write on? Okay, so shall we say two and a half minutes? Two and a half minutes from now to write your story, 
include your word in there and then we're going to listen to your stories and we're going to try and guess what the word was. Seb, did you want to say something? Oh, see you on. One more minute for your story. If you don't want to write it down, you can just keep it in your head and tell it to us. Is everyone just about ready? I can see Rosa's still writing. George, you're still writing, are you? Charlie, are you ready? St st should we give you a little bit longer? Austin and Max, we can't see you. Are you, are you ready? And Jessica? Not yet. We still have a bit more to do. OK, so Neither. we'll give you another. We don't want to go too long because we'll run out of time and we won't be able to hear the stories. So one more minute. How are you doing, Ruth? We are almost finished. Fantastic. Okay, one more minute. Can you send a message in the chat? Thirty seconds and then we're starting. Okay, time is up. If you haven't finished, don't worry. Now, there are some people that we can't see, so um, it's going to be difficult. Can you, um, people that we can't see, Jessica and Jenny, Austin and Max, can you send us, aha, that Austin and Max have appeared. Can you um, send us a message in the chat to let us know that you're there? Uh, so now, who is feeling brave and would like to go first? 
George, nice one. Okay, so just give it a minute, George, make sure everybody's ready. And when you're ready, nice clear voice. We won't be guessing because, of course, we know what the words are, but that you, we're only going to have three guesses. Off you go, George. The nanny had, had to look after the children when they were sick. Or, it was tough, but she had to plough through it. <laughs> Amazing. Very, very good. Uh, anybody have a guess about what George's word was? Rosa? Was it plough? Oh, good. Guess was it plough, George? It wasn't. No. Okay, two more guesses. Ruth, have you got a guess? We can't hear you. You're on mute at the minute, Ruth. My guess was plough too. Oh, you guessed plough as well. Oh, you did well there putting that word plough in there, George. Well done. Uh, Charlie, you got a guess? George, I think you're going to have to tell us. Sickle. No, George's word was sickle. Well done. Very good. Uh, so thank you for kicking us off, George. Um, who's ready to go next? Yeah, we're Ruth? Mm, Shall we have it. Ruth next and then Rosa? OK, Ruth, come on. We're ready for you. It was a busy day at the big house. The Lord and Lady were having a banquet. The grandest party ever. Unfortunately, I woke up with a fever and a sore throat, but no one was able to help me. I had no choice but to get on with the party preparations, even though I felt really ill. I made jelly cake and wild boar sausages. Delicious. Absolutely superb. Thank you, Ruth. I don't think anybody is going to get it. Uh, OK, who'd like to have a guess? Uh, George? Banquet. Was it Banquet, Ruth? No. Uh, Charlie, have you got a guess? It was Banquet. I was going to guess Banquet. You were going to guess, guess Banquet. How about you, Jessica? What do you, did you think it was? Uh, was it Cook? Was it, Ruth? No. Okay, we've got one more guess. Austin and Max, have you got a guess? Go on, Max. I think it's probably sausages. Was it sausages, Ruth? No. It wasn't. So you won the game. Well done. What was it? Fever. It was fever. She had a fever, but she still had to do all the cooking for the party. Let's give Ruth a round of applause. Very nice work, Ruth. Thank you very much. OK, so Rosa, are you ready? I worked in the big house as a cook. When I was young, I had have tiaras, dresses and skirts, but of course I couldn't, so I grew up to be a happy cook, paid £15 a year. I cooked for the master and I was happy. Superb, thank you Rosa. Okay, anyone like to have a guess about what Rosa's word might have been? Uh, George? Master. Was it master? No. Ruth. Go on, Ruth. Um, was it Tiara? Was it Tiara, Rosa? Yes. Uh, it was. Well done for guessing, Ruth. And well done for a great story, Rosa. Thank you. Uh, so who haven't we heard from? We haven't heard from Austin and Max. Charlie, we've not heard from you. So should we go for Austin first? Oh, Max first. Oh, I've got you the wrong way round. Sorry. It's fine. Austin on on the left and Max on the right. Thank you. So I'll, I'll try and remember. I'm not very good at left and right, but um, off you go. Ghost boy, the hall boy, hall boy. The he wasn't a um. Boys, can you start again? Because the sound isn't very good. I don't know why, but we, we didn't have very good sound then. So could you start back from the beginning, Austin? Or Max? I'll read Max's. The whole okay. boy is not a rascal. He was 
a, a good boy. Thank you very much. Ooh, okay. Rose has got her hand up. What do we think? Is it rascal? Is it rascal? Yes. 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 It was rascal. Well done for guessing, Rosa. Thank you. Oh, now, whose story was that? Was that Max's story or? Max. Okay, well done. Thank you, Max. So we have Charlie and then we'll come to Austin. Does that sound okay? Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, Charlie's putting his into chat. Okay, Charlie. Uh, okay, so um, Jessica, did you have a story? You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, I have a story. Shall we have your story, Jessica? Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, hang on, I just need to go where I wrote it. Do you need us to go to someone else while you find it? Sorry, hang on. Well, there's no hurry. Um, uh, I think I've got it now. Okay, well done. Okay, should I start? Yes, please. Cook told me to go down there. It was a small room for food that people like me would have to go down to to get the food ingredients for supper. Cook said that she couldn't make the food without the ingredients in that room. Uh-huh. Okay, so you've done it a slightly different way, haven't you, Jessica? So you haven't said the word, but you've told us what the word is. That's really clever. I think we should definitely give you a, a, a round of applause. Um, anybody know, so what was Jessica describing? A special room for keeping food ingredients in. Uh, Rosa? Is it the kitchen? It's um, a pretty good guess. It's a little room that's usually um, part of the kitchen, but, but a sort of slightly separate part of the kitchen. George? Oh, oh what's that? what did you think it was? Pantry. The pantry. Is that what you said, George, as well? Is that right, Jessica? Yeah. Was, it, was it pantry? Was yeah, that right? it was. Well done, everybody. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, okay, so we had Austin before. Now we're going to have Max. Or did we have Max? Oh, I'm so confused. So <laughs> I'm sorry. So we're going to have whichever of what Austin and Max it was that we didn't have before. And I think it yeah, is. It was me. Austin. Right, the come on. Would, come on, Austin. The cook would go to the nursery to give the nanny food. Okay, thank you very much. So the cook would go to the nursery to give the nanny food. Any guesses? Anybody who hasn't had a guess yet? Jessica, what do you think? Um, is it cook? Was it cook? No. Mm, no. Uh, Ruth? Um... Nursery. Yes. Nursery. Okay. Well done. So that is the end of that. Oh, we, we Charlie. So, come on, Charlie. We, how could I forget? Okay. So it's, shall I read it out, Charlie? Okay. So I drink all sorts of drinks from beers to wines or champagnes to gins. I like every single drink. That is my story. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much, Charlie. So what do we think? Shall I say it again? I drink all sorts of drinks from beers to wine or champagnes to gins. I like every single drink. That is my story. So, uh, okay, Rosa? Is it beer? Is it beer, Charlie? Nope. 
Uh, Ruth. Gin? Is it gin, Charlie? Nope. George. Champagne. Is it champagne? Okay, well done. Well done, everybody. That was such good fun playing that with you. Um, and I'm really sad because we, it's actually five o'clock and we've very nearly run out of time. And um, before we finish, I think Gemma's going to tell you about what we're doing next. So hang on for a minute so we can tell you about that. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining our session today. It's been absolutely brilliant and you've been so creative. It, it's, you know, we've, we've really enjoyed it over here as well. I hope you have as well. Um, so just to, to let you know about uh, next month's session, it's going to be called Bugs, Bees and Books. And it's going to be about uh, a day at the Gloucester Archives, which is where uh, we do these broadcasts from. Um, so it would be great if you can join us. And that's going to be on Wednesday, the 4th of August um, from 4 till 5, as usual, uh, on a Wednesday. OK, I think we're probably going to have to wrap up right there because it is five o'clock. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Shall thank we have you. a big goodbye? So uh, after three, one, two, three. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. It was so Bye. nice to see you all. Take care. Bye. See you next time, we hope. Bye. Bye. Thank you.